If your SAM is $100 million, not market value, but in serviceable, addressable market, your SAM, I want you to explain to me on the back of an envelope in less than two minutes how you get to that. Break it down to me like I was a five-year-old. It takes time, skill, and a little bit of luck to convince someone to invest in your business. And you need to do your homework. What will it cost to acquire customers? How much will they pay for my product? And what margins can we expect on those sales? The majority of founders can never do that. They fail miserably at it. Or they'll say, hey, can I open up my spreadsheet or I'll talk to my CFO. If you give me the, let me talk to my CFO, you've lost me. Like immediately, like I've switched off. Welcome to the second season of Grit and Growth from Stanford C, the show where Africa and South Asia's intrepid entrepreneurs share their trials and triumphs with insights from Stanford faculty on how to tackle challenges and grow your business. As we developed the first season of Grit and Growth, we spoke to a lot of entrepreneurs who shared a similar concern. Finding investors, particularly at an early stage, can make or break your business. So it's no wonder that's top of mind for so many of our guests. How do you convince the people with cash that you and your idea are a worthwhile investment? Over the course of season one, we pose that question to active investors focused on startups and early stage businesses in Africa and South Asia. We heard a wide range of advice about how to fund your venture. For this episode, we've compiled the best guidance on financing from some of the top experts of our first season. You'll hear about what investors are looking for in a founder, how founders should vet potential backers, and what holds true across markets. There are a lot of opinions on the best way to raise capital, but while people may differ on strategy, most everyone agrees that fundraising is a critical aspect of every entrepreneur's job. Many founders think that fundraising is um, kind of something they do on the side, but you need to embrace the fact that it is part of your job description and to have that mindset. So it's not that entre- investors are wasting your time. You need investors to grow your business. That's Andreata Muforo, partner at Nairobi-based venture capital firm TLCom Capital. And she, among many other investors, see fundraising as active, not passive. It's something an entrepreneur does, not something that happens to them, which means you can get better with practice. And that's great news for entrepreneurs because you'll be fundraising throughout the life cycle of your business. To review the main stages of that journey, let's turn to Zach George, who is managing partner of Launch Africa Ventures, another African VC. So you've got pre-seed funding, which is essentially you're funding companies or founders that are just post-idea and they're busy building an MVP, a prototype, right? That funding is almost entirely driven by founder capital themselves, friends and family, and maybe the odd early stage angel investor, right? Those pools of money could range anywhere from $10,000 to maybe half a million dollars at a stretch, depending on what industry you're in, right? That's pre-seed funding. Then you've got seed funding. And seed funding also has a big friends and family component to it. But that's when you start seeing angel groups and angel networks coming in. So local angel networks from an Africa context, you'd have you know, the South African angel network, the Nigerian angel network, and sort of going down to city. So Lagos angel network, the Cape Town angel network, et cetera. So angel networks, friends and family. And importantly, this is where accelerators and incubators come in. So most accelerators, I mean, obviously the ones that we're familiar with, like the YCs and the startup boot camps, the tech stores of the world, but regional accelerators play a role in providing anywhere from $20,000 to $100,000 worth of funding. This stage is is still predominantly pre-revenue, but post-MVP, but you do have quite a few companies that are just post-revenue. And revenue at that stage could be prototypes, pilots, POCs, proof of concepts, but you do find some companies that are that have recurring subscription revenue as well. But at this stage, it's still too early for institutional capital. The one exception to that is hyper-local, regional-focused VC funds. So there are a few seed VC funds local to just a city or just a country that may write small checks. The average size of rounds at the seed stage 
is between half a million dollars to at a stretch two million dollars and that's again from maybe an emerging market slash africa context then you've got the series a stage which is where your first institutional check comes in that is usually led by a lead vc fund Series A round sizes range from a low of $2 million, that's very low, to as high as $25 to $30 million rounds. You usually have a lead VC that commits half of the round at least, so 50% of the round size. You then have super angels or large angel groups that sort of finish out the rest of the round, and at the most, two to three other VCs. There are cases where Series A rounds can have up to six to seven VCs, but the norm is one lead VC fund, a couple of other VC funds and angels and super angels filling out the rest of the round. That's Series A. Series B and Series C is what people offer, often refer to as growth capital, growth and late stage capital. And those range from anything north of $10 million round sizes all the way up to, I mean, Flutterwave last week announced $170 million Series C round. So like I said, $10 million all the way up to $150 million round. So that would be Series B and Series C. As you can tell, fundraising is a journey, which is why Zach advocates casting a wide net when looking for investors. In fact, he has a kind of sneaky strategy for getting valuable face time with those busy VCs. At the pre-seed stage, you've got to start early. You've got to start talking to investors whilst you're building your product. A good analogy that I give, which is often used in the industry, is you know, ask for advice and you may get some money. Ask for money and you may get some advice. When you're talking to angels, and this happens to me a lot, a lot of founders that are mature enough in the market will come to see, listen, Zach, I know you've done a ton of angel investments. This is what I'm doing. Can you give me some advice on who I should be talking to? What should I be pivoting it into? And honestly, I'll spend a few weeks when I can just giving them advice. And I will open doors for them. And maybe a month later, I'll write them a check. But I wrote them a check because they involved me in their business planning. And the right founders will come to you and say, thank you very much for helping me think differently. Here's a small half a percent stake in my company in advisory shares. I'd like you to also be an angel in my company. So getting a prominent angel investor or a prominent mentor on your advisory board early on that also drops you a $5,000 or $10,000 check is worth so much more than the money they give you. But ask them for advice. And then they will open doors for you. I mean, it's, it's crazy advice, but it works. I want to repeat Zach's punchline. Ask for money, you might get advice. Ask for advice, you might get funding. Your earliest investor contacts may usefully challenge your own assumptions about your business and your business model. How you receive their advice matters because the other unique resource your startup has is you, the entrepreneur. Early on, funders invest as much in founders as they do in ideas. And that's certainly true of Sandeep Singh, managing director of Nexus Venture Partners in India. But what exactly are investors like Sandeep looking for in an entrepreneur? So I want to get a little bit into this whole question of how do you get to know an entrepreneur? How do, what characteristics are you looking for? When somebody walks in the door, what do you need to know about them? Number one is energy level. You can tell from a person in the way that they interact with you, what their energy levels are, and how will they sustain their energy as they build out the business. Define energy. It comes from passion. It comes from internal drive, but it's also about how you are seeing the desire to build a business. And good entrepreneurs just want to build something big, right? They're not coming in and saying, I just want to solve a problem. There are many people that want to solve problems, but these are people who are saying, I want to solve a problem at scale. I want to solve a problem with a good group of people. I want to build, I want to have people around me that are equally uh, passionate about building things. That energy, that passion sort of is the starting point. So they're not just a lone wolf. And they don't just have a compelling problem they want to solve. They have a growth vision and they at least have some people who are with them. That's correct. And so you're not looking at the numbers at all at first, or have you already done a bunch of due diligence before they even get in the front door? From a seed and series A perspective, 
it is less about numbers and it's more about people. Numbers really start coming into account in series B and series C, but at a seed and series A, very few companies will have numbers that you can depend on for making a decision on a long-term basis. That individual, when they're presenting to me, should get me as excited about the problem as they are, because that's what they're going to do day in, day out, once they have the company and they're out in the market. They're going to be trying to convince customers. They're going to try and convince the best talent and employees. They're going to be trying and convince the best partners to work with them, right? So they have to get me convinced. It's not sales, but it's motivation, right? It's getting it's getting that trust built in the other person that, hey, I can make this happen. On the other hand, Sandeep doesn't want people to be too attached to their ideas. The final thing is the ability to listen and adapt. So what you need to be able to, and this is what we test in the in the conversation, is we'll throw them a curveball. We'll, we'll ask a question which would get you upset or which will sort of say, hey, this, this just can't work, right? So, and we see how the person reacts. Do they get upset or are they sort of thinking, why is this guy telling me this? What do I need to do differently? And, and you know, you can, you can tell that this person's wheels are turning in their head and they're, they're thinking about the problem. They're thinking, so that ability to listen because the market is always telling you something. The competitors are telling you something. So you want them to have the passion and, persua- and the persuasive power of an evangelist, but one who also listens. Yes, because if you don't listen, then you are stubborn. And the risk with being stubborn is you can hit your head on the wall and never be able to get across it. So another way I would think about this is you want someone who's in love with the problem they're trying to solve, not with their specific solution. In addition to a compelling entrepreneur, a strong understanding of the market is paramount to an investor like Zach. Ultimately, a tech startup has to be obsessed with two things, product market fit and problem solution fit, right? If you can get these two things right, the market and economics will determine everything else. But you got to get these two things right. Know your customers really well, know your target market, and know what the unit economics are. Once you understand these three things, the market will figure out the rest. So one of the one of the common mistakes is founders assume that just because they've started a particular company that they know the market better than anyone else. That is, I wouldn't say categorically true, but in most cases, not the case, right? So a pitfall that a lot of founders have is they just do not do enough research on the market and their competitors as they should be. I've been in way too many discussions with founders where I've embarrassed the crap out of them because they have no idea who the second, third, fourth, fifth, or even 10th competitors are in their industry. And it goes above and beyond just their industry. They may have a business idea with some customers, but they just don't know enough about what folks in the industry are doing. I mean, the amount of market research that founders do is way too little at the early stage. So they don't know the competitive landscape. They don't know the total addressable market. They can't answer this classic value proposition statement that this is the problem. This is my solution. This is why my solution is better. They don't have that. Product market fit is important to Andreata as well, but it's not the be all end all. She also focuses on the business model and the team surrounding the entrepreneur. Three main questions that we want to answer. So the question is, is this, a, is this an attractive market? Because we're looking for large, underserved, growing uh, markets. Is this a good company? And then next is, is, this a, is the business model that the company is pursuing one that can capture the market? And then is this a team that can execute on that business model? And then the third bucket of questions we're asking ourselves is around, is this a good investment? The team is, is very important throughout the life, whether it's early or it's growing. So we look at the vision of the founders, the strength of the sea level in terms of the experience, the execution, what is it that they've achieved? And then we also form a view and an opinion around the strength of the team, realizing that, you know, these are great team for this stage, but probably not for the next stage. Pranav Pai of 314 Capital also highlights the importance of your team because the kind of growth that investors are looking for can't be achieved alone. I think the number one determinant factor today besides domain expertise for us is the capacity of the founders to hire a fantastic team. 
we've learned that there's a certain characteristic set uh, in founders, and sometimes no one person has it. So it has to be a team of founders, maybe two, maybe three, or more sometimes. But that combination of, of founders need to be able to attract great people every year. Because the rate at which these companies need to grow, if the human capital side doesn't keep up, you're almost always going to fail to meet expectations. Investors will conduct tons of due diligence on prospective investments. For Ido Sum, Andriato's partner at TLCom, the best entrepreneurs do the same research on potential funders. Founders tend to forget their role in this process, which is to do the same due diligence on their respective investors. This is a very long-term relationship in which, you know, during five or six or eight years, you would write a couple of checks, but at the rest of the time, you work together. And uh, I would urge all of these entrepreneurs, more so in emerging markets where this is maybe less common, to reach out, to speak to other founders in the portfolios of their potential investors, companies, and really make their homework, you know, because this is much more about the person and the relationship than just the check in, in our view. The other thing that founders make a lot of mistakes, if you want to call it mistakes, is not doing enough diligence on their investors, right? So to me, a good founder conversation with an investor goes like this, right? I walk into an investor's office. I already know the last 10 investments that fund has made in what sectors and what sub-industries. I know how much they invested. I know where these companies are doing right now. So I go and talk to the investor I'm talking to and I say, listen, I noticed that these four companies that you invested in are doing so well or whatever. This is how I can add value to you as a fund. And this is how I can create synergies between ourselves and your portfolio companies. So knowing exactly what the mandate and strategy of your potential investor is, how their portfolio companies have performed, and creating value for them is something that very few founders do. They just see investors as ATMs, and that doesn't work. It's such an easy drop-dead giveaway. All this research can give you a big leg up with VCs. But perhaps the most important information Zach and Sandeep look for are the specific details of how you plan to grow. That is, after all, why they're investing in the first place. Good founders will say, this is how I get to $100 million in SA. And, and they'll start something like this. Currently, we work in Gaborone. Population is, is X. We've got 2% of the market. On average, they spend $10 buying this. So $10 times this is that. We're growing at 10% month to month, so that gets us to this. If we were to open up in a new city, we get to this. And they can explain to me in a logical way how they get $200 million. And while India may be a completely different market from Southern Africa, the same logic still applies. What we do look for is size of market. So for us, it's very important that you're planning to target a large market. And the reason why I say planning versus saying you're targeting a large market is because there's a third part to this, which is focus. So you're passionate about solving a problem. You know that you're going after a large market, but you're doing it in a very focused way. So sometimes what ends up happening is the focus can make it appear that, mark, that the market is small because you know, you've defined a niche. You're, you're going after the, the top 100,000 customers that really need audio books, right? And it may appear like a small market, but you can walk me through and say, okay, if I get these 100,000, then I can get the next million. And then I can get the next you know, 5 million. And many entrepreneurs struggle with that. That ability to walk me through why what you're doing right now will allow you the right to get to the next set of customers. How will you be able to take the learnings from your 3 million in revenue and scale it to 10, 20, 50, right? The, this is my growth horizon to get to this point. And then I'm going to go on to the next growth horizon and the next one, right? And an entrepreneur that's thinking that way is also very well aligned from an investor perspective because that's how investments work. You start by saying, okay, my first thing is I need to get to a product market fit. The next thing is I need to get to a GTM fit. I need to be able to have a, have a go-to market model, which is repeatable, which is scalable. 
the next thing is I'm now going to be able to protect my moat, whatever I've created as a moat, right? So the, at each stage, you are thinking through what is the nature of problem you're solving in your business. And a good entrepreneur is able to sort of outline that. When you start fundraising, it can be tempting to team up with the first person who just says yes. But that investor will play a key role in your journey. So it's worth the extra effort to make sure it's a good fit. Sandeep has a few suggestions for how to do this. The starting point is, is this investor passionate about this problem? Maybe not as much as I am, but at least has enough passion and is thinking about this not just from a standpoint of, okay, I'll bet behind Sandeep and he'll make me money. So this is a person who has thought about this problem, has a point of view on it, and uh, is therefore able to ask me intelligent questions. Wait, I got to stop you right there. So they shouldn't be looking for someone who just says, you convinced me here, but let's do it. You actually ought to go past that because I think a lot of entrepreneurs would be so excited if that was the initial response. They would feel like they just hit a home run and onward. I would at least ask the person, what about what I said convinced you? In a nice way. Is there anything that I could do that I should be doing differently? Is there anything that, you know, what is it that you think I should, you know, do more of? Or, or some way to bring that, at least check that this person is just not a, a sort of lazy check writer, but is actually going to be a partner with you through the journey. Because you want more than the check. Yes, because this is true for both the entrepreneur and the investor. Because any any startup is not a straight line. You are going to run into problems which you hadn't anticipated at the time of the fundraise. And if there is an understanding as to why that investment was made, you can always go back to that and say, this is what we were looking to do. What was wrong with our assumption? And that ability to do that requires that there has to be some common set of assumptions between the entrepreneur and the investor. So if you haven't had that conversation at the start and the investor just gave, wrote you a check, then how do you have this conversation later? This partnership aspect is especially important because investors like Zach can offer much more than just money. If all you bring to the table is financial capital, you shouldn't be investing early. Angel investing requires time, resources, effort, and networks. And smart founders have learned to say no to investors that don't add any of the value outside of that. So as an early stage investor at the pre-seed stage of a business, as an investor, you have to add significantly more than just capital. So what does that entail? A, you've got to understand the power of networks exceptionally well. So if you're not opening doors to other investors in that current round of future investors, that's a big red flag. Number two, if you're not opening doors to corporates, but specifically insurers, banks, telcos, retailers, manufacturing firms, or whatever corporates are relevant to solving distribution for that particular technology startup, again, that's not a big value add if you can't do it. Number three, if you aren't able to understand the applicability of that particular piece of technology to the industry and be an evangelist for that product in the broader ecosystem, your money ain't going anywhere. So you got to be adding at least two of these three attributes outside of just your money. Otherwise, there's no point investing early. On, on the flip side, good investors are investors that go above and beyond what I just said and, and help your founders with things like recruiting, with talent sourcing. I mean, people often ignore HR and human resources when it comes to helping founders. A lot of founders are constantly shuffling their time between A, raising capital, B, striking partnerships with large corporates from a commercialization standpoint, acquiring customers that are B2C, and hiring. While funders can bring a lot to the table beyond finances, it's also worth understanding what they don't do. And that's a conversation investor Pranav Pai has with every founder before they reach a deal. Uh, so we're very clear, our involvement is on the strategy side. Our involvement is solving problems for you. We're very clear what we won't do. 
So we're very clear, we're not going to win your deals. Uh, we're not going to hire for you. We're not going to build your product for you, although we could. <laughs> we enjoy, enjoy doing that sometimes. But really, I think there needs to be a frank conversation between the founders and all their investors with how that dynamic should be between each set of partners. And for us, uh, it's what we've figured out works best is a very honest conversation as we're closing the round. Saying, here's everything we can do. We have five teams inside the firm. Uh, we'll help you with recruitment, with technology, with, with, of course, capital development, fundraising, market access. And we'll help you, of course, make a plan, but we're not going to execute that for you because that's interference. And when issues do arise, the relationship and communication you've built with investors will be crucial, as Ido has discovered. We are trying to get better at being good investors and good board members and good contributors. And there are times where you don't see eye in eye or you're not empathetic enough or at times you know you, you try and work with parts of the team without getting the permission of the CEO you know even if unintentional so I cannot say that there have never been instances in which we had issues to solve but this is part of the journey this is part of the game and I think you know it's much more about how you solve it rather than promising you'll never have such issues. All of this research and pitching and relationship building takes time. It's important for entrepreneurs to have that expectation going in because investment just doesn't happen overnight. It takes a bit of time. So you need to have many conversations with many investors before they invest. And, you know, investors have their process in terms of kind of the due diligence that they do, the conversations that they need to have. So it's also, I think, a level of patience, right? What does it look like to embrace your role as a fundraiser and a founder. There's a mental fitness that you need because you get rejected, right? So you need to be able to pick yourself up from that mental place where you're discouraged and keep going and keep having those conversations with the same level of energy and enthusiasm to keep going. I think also for entrepreneurs, you know, they love to build, which is great. And that's why we back them. That's why also fundraising can seem like it's in the way. So I think also for to prepare, when you prepare for fundraising, it's also to get other people within your C-level to delegate some of your the things that you used to do so that you can focus on fundraising because it does require time to be able to do quite well. It's a competitive world out there, especially when you're vying for capital. But in compiling these excerpts from our first season, I was reminded that financing is a symbiotic relationship. VCs are vying just as hard to find promising companies to invest in. Just ask Pranav. I think if you have to build value on the, on the private side, you have to work with, with the founders. That's a privilege you have. That's an advantage you have. And that's something that if investors use, if they use this correctly, I think you can make magic. Investor success depends on passionate entrepreneurs like you. So do your research. Understand how you'll fit into the market and their portfolio of investments. Inquire about what they can offer beyond capital. And above all, share your specific plans for growth. These steps are fundraising best practices. As you continue along the path, embrace fundraising as an ongoing journey a key part of your job that may never be fully finished. Whether you're approaching friends and family or launching a Series B round, think of each stage as a learning opportunity and you'll keep improving until fundraising becomes second nature. Thank you to all the experts we heard in today's episode. Andriata Muforu, Zach George, Sandeep Singh, Pranav Pai, and Ido Sum. If you want to hear more from any of these guests, check out our first season where we have whole episodes on the mechanics of early stage financing, as well as the African and Indian fundraising ecosystems. This has been Grit and Growth with the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and I'm your host, Darius Teeter. If you like this episode, leave us a review on your podcast app. It really helps us to share the stories of these incredible entrepreneurs with as many people as possible. To learn how Stanford Graduate School of Business is partnering with entrepreneurs in Africa and Asia, head over to the Stanford Seed website at seed.stanford.edu slash podcast. Grit and Growth is a podcast by Stanford Seed. Lori Fuller and Erica Amuake Ajay researched and developed content for this episode. Kendra Gladich is our production coordinator, and our executive producer is Tiffany Steves. With writing and production from Andrew Gannam and sound design and mixing by Alex Bennett at Lower Street Media. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.